والأموال والأنفس والثمرات وبشر وبشر الصابرين الذين إذا أصابتهم مصيبة قالوا قالوا إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون إنا كل شيء من الخوف والجوع ونقص من الأموال والأنفس والثمرات وبشر وبشر الصابرين الذين إذا أصابتهم مصيبة قالوا قالوا إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون إن كل شيء من الخوف والجوع ونقص من الأموال والأنفس والثمرات وبشر وبشر الصابرين الذين إذا أصابتهم مصيبة قالوا قالوا إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون إن كل شيء من الخوف والجوع ونقص من الأموال والأنفس والثمرات وبشر وبشر الصابرين الذين إذا أصابتهم مصيبة قالوا قالوا إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون It's 2000 hours in Banjul and from our studios on MDA Road, this is the news file uh, coming up in our headlines this evening. His Excellency, President Adam Abaro, receives in audience over 600 imams and religious scholars at the State House, ensuring safe and standard housing in the Gambia. The Department of Physical Planning and Housing begins a major demolition exercise in the capital city, Banjul. The United Nations Population Fund donates 1,000 dignity kids to the July 7th windstorm victims as they struggle to rebuild their lives. As the journalism profession continues to face challenges in the wake of digital technology, the Premium Time Center for Investigative Journalism trains Gambian journalists on the basics of fact-checking. Well, I am Momo Dinjai. And I am Winifred Nicole, also coming up on the news file. On the international scene, Ethiopia's government warns increased troops deployment as Tigray rebels refuse to withdraw from recently captured areas. Well, new data suggests Johnson and Johnson vaccines work well against the Delta variant and recipients do not need a boost shot as vaccination rolls out for homeless people in Cape Town, South Africa. Well, details of these and much more coming ahead in this edition of the News File. Do stay with us.
begin this edition of the news file with presidential matters where over 600 imams and religious scholars have today called on the president his excellency adam abaro at the state house in banjul the delegation was at the presidency to hold talks with the gambian leader and pray for the president his government and the people of the country President Barrow used the occasion to call for religious tolerance among scholars and urge imams of the different religious factions to continue preaching for peace across the country. The delegation comprised members of the Supreme Islamic Council as well as Raudatul Majalis of the Gambia and Sharifs. Details of that engagement will air in our subsequent newscast. Well, Modu, I think this is a laudable initiative having to uh, meet with imams who, you know, and, are and key of course it's, I think in it's preaching really timely. peace. Of course. It's really timely. Now, over now to ongoing efforts to ensure safe and standard housing in the Gambia to this effect, the Physical Planning and Housing Department has begun a major demolition exercise in the capital city. Well, I, Ibrahim Ajalo covered Friday's exercise and he filed in this report. Well, if you have never seen the work of a bulldozer, this is what it does. At least 25 buildings in the capital city that are considered unsafe will be demolished. Friday's exercise began with this story on street. The intention is to ensure safety for life and properties. Isa Kamara is the Deputy Director of the Physical Planning and Housing Department. If you can remember some years back, uh, I think not far from here, at the garage, uh, uh, Brikama garage, a building collapsed there and I think two or three people lost their life. And even this year, uh, there was another one collapsed. Luckily, there, uh, I think one person was harmed but no dead. So it's not safe to have such buildings within the, uh, the city. We notified their owners. And of course they agreed because uh, I could remember one of them came to our office asking us to go and demolish his property. We have not reached that side yet, but they all agreed. Engineers on the ground say the demolition was necessary in keeping standard housing in the city and beyond. We have realized that you know um, uh, most of the, these buildings that we have identified are dilapidated, meaning you know they are they cannot be repaired, and there is need for them to be um, uh, demolished. So if they are demolished, it means that you know, they are going to protect the people from um, uh, the disasters that might come along with um, uh, dilapidated structures. I don't know, you know the lifespan that the engineers who have designed you know, these structures for, but through our observations and the, the, the criteria that we have established to see whether a building is dilapidated or not, not you know, we see most of these buildings have fallen within those categories. So that's why, you know, we, we, we have to demolish them. The construction industry in the country is expanding, especially in the urban area. However, the physical planning department has outlined criteria for construction. But are these criteria followed and what happens if not? According to our regulation, any structure that has been built without this physical planning, you know, approval is deemed unsafe. So if you, if you build a structure without a permit, it means it's, it is unsafe and all unsafe buildings are liable to be demolished. Banjul has since been in the limelight of development since the advent of the borough administration. And this is part of efforts to give the city a new facelift. Ibrahim Ajalo, GRTS News. From that report by GRTS is Ibrahim Ajalo. We now expand the discussion on the ongoing demolition exercise and plans ahead to ensure public safety and proper planning. Well, in our studio is Mr. Momodu Manjang, Director, Department of Physical Planning. And Mr. Manjang, welcome to GRTS News File. Thank you for having me. Now, uh, first of all, uh, can you talk to us about the mandate of the Department of Physical Planning? Uh, Guided by the land use plans that divide uh, areas into different uses, mm -hmm. let's say residential, agricultural, uh, industrial, institutions and other uses, mm -hmm. the department is mandated to ensure that uh, there is efficient uh, distribution of land mm -hmm. um, for different uses mm -hmm. and that is in order to create a, a better living environment. Mm -hmm. And the department also ensure that uh, all developments are conformed to the land use plan. Mm -hmm. 
Now we've seen uh, pictures of this uh, demolition exercise as covered by our reporter Ibrahim Ajalo. What exactly led to the demolition exercise you're currently embarking on? Yeah, we, as far as our mandate is concerned, uh, physical planning always ensure that all buildings are safe for public uh, human habitation. Mm -hmm. And if you look at built Banjul, most of these buildings were built during the colonial days. Mm -hmm. And for that reason, so we've realized that well, some of them are really dilapidated. Mm -hmm. As a result, uh, the department, in collaboration with key stakeholders, mm -hmm. that is uh, BCC, um, NDMA, uh, Fire Service, Gantel, and Nave. Mm -hmm. So we embark on to identify all the structures, uh, the dilapidated structures. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I remember 25 were identified. Uh, last year we targeted to demolish uh, uh, four. Mm -hmm. But okay. due to uh, logistics constraints, we were only able to demolish one. So this year we decided to continue Be with the support of uh, BCC and uh, NDMA. Mm -hmm. Equipment is available, so we intend to continue with the demolition of the rest of the dilapidated buildings. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Mr. Manjang, you mentioned that because uh, some of the uh, buildings being demolished um, currently is because um, they are old. But um, tell us, uh, how is the process done? Yeah, the uh, process, the way it was done, what we did was uh, um, we make sure that institutions come together Mm -hmm. uh, to come up uh, with points mm -hmm. that would say how to go about the, these things. And this was used to ensure that, well, uh, the identified buildings that are dilapidated. Mm -hmm. Key among them was uh, they, they ensure that, well, the uh, reinforcement, the strength of the reinforcement of the columns and beams were looked at and then the, the, this other thing, how do you call it, the safety of the building. Okay. Yeah, so when those things were identified, Mm -hmm. uh, we also ensure that uh, if those the, the area the building is declared as an uh, unsafe building, okay. if that happens, uh, we notify the owner of the building mm -hmm. to demolish the property within a time framework. Mm -hmm. If we fail to do that, then the department will come in to de demolish it. Mm -hmm. We also ensure that uh, those within that uh, property are evicted. And we also ensure that a notice is placed on the building okay. to inform the neighbors that they should avoid that area. Mm -hmm. So we also engage NAWEC, since they are part of the committee, okay. and GAMTEL to disconnect all connections to that building. Mm -hmm. And from there we BCC as well? You mentioned yeah, BCC. BCC, yes, because, yes, uh -huh. because uh, during the process, mm -hmm. they were very key in this. Even the, the council was a part of the process. Okay. Now, um, you mentioned Banjul as the, I mean, current location. Um, but um, tell us, um, where next? Uh, um, well, our plan is, uh -huh. maybe we will spend time with Banjul, because the other thing, the other thing we want to do is uh, to come up with the zoning of Banjul. Mm -hmm. Still, we collaborate with the council and other stakeholders okay. to ensure where we have the commercial area, uh -huh. where we have the uh, mixed-use area and pure uh, residential area, predominantly residential area. This is going to help us to avoid warehouses and other stores within the residential area. Mm -hmm. So that's the next thing we wanted to do. Okay. And from there, we'll come to Greater Banjul area. Okay. where we will look at the order planning aspect of that. Good. Now, away from the, the demolition exercise itself, uh, why are our communities not uh, planned properly to avoid floods and ensure better roads, community parks, and other places like mosques and cemeteries? I think that's a very good question. Mm -hmm. um, um, when you talk of uh, urban planning, mm -hmm. it requires uh, institutional collaboration mm -hmm. and community participation. Mm -hmm. But uh, we've, there is evidence that uh, this, there is a gap mm -hmm. in terms of uh, community uh, institutional collaboration and community participation in pl the planning process. Okay. And for that reason, uh, we've uh, realized that, well, uh, if especially, let's put it this way, mm -hmm. uh, roads are constructed mm -hmm. without a proper drainage, mm -hmm. and you will also see that uh, the communities are allocating areas mm -hmm. without, uh, who are not planning minded, Consultations proper, yeah. proper conditions uh, and this has created all these problems. Okay. So definitely this contributed a lot because the community should understand mm -hmm. 
that in order to have a proper settlement, mm -hmm. we should ensure that uh, all these settlements have uh, social amenities, mm -hmm. that is the cemetery, schools, uh, and then other things, because the neighbors should, should enjoy those facilities. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So without that, let them not see that, well, giving spaces for those uh, uh, social amenities is a waste mm -hmm. of land. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is for the benefit of them exactly. and the community, exactly. especially the neighborhood. Exactly. Okay. Now, uh, in the future, uh, what plans do you have to cater for well-planned cities and communities in the Gambia? As a department, we feel that, uh, as I rightly said, we need institutional collaboration. Mm -hmm. For that being the case, uh, we uh, set up a uh, established a committee called Development Control Committee mm -hmm. that okay. comprises the uh, key stakeholders like NEA, mm -hmm. Fire Service, uh, and other stakeholders. And the reason being that we want to make sure that uh, all developments conform to our standard. Mm -hmm. So coming together as an institution so we can share ideas and then come up with better planning. We also want to ensure that well, we've already started that to sensitize the community and the local authority. Mm -hmm. And we started that last year, even this year, uh, we wanted to continue with the local authority. Last year we started with the Alcalos of Comanot, mm -hmm. and this year we are targeting other areas. And we are not also stopping that, we are also doing this community planning. Mm -hmm. When the is really participatory, mm -hmm. we identify certain areas where we work with the community to plan for them. Then and it's from the grassroots. Yeah, so from the grassroots. Okay. Interestingly, okay. the community will come with, with the options of giving their own land to create those, to provide those social amenities. Quite important there. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Momodu Manjang, Director of Physical Planning Department there, speaking to GRTS about plan demolition exercise within Banjul to ensure more public safety in the rainy season. Interesting conversation there, Momodo. Thank you very much for having me. Well, you're watching the news file, and it's coming to you live from our main studios on MDI Road. I am Winifred Nicole, co-hosting this Jai, evening course, with... Winifred, it's good to have you here once again. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, but moving on. The United Nations Population Fund has donated 1,000 dignity kits to the July 7th windstorm victims. As Fatou Janembay reports, the donation held at the NDMA headquarters is aimed at supporting victims rebuild their lives. The United Nations Population Fund has taken the move to help victims of the July 7th windstorm by donating a thousand dignity kits. Beneficiaries include women and children as the group of society that suffers the most when disasters strike. Kunle Adeyemi is the United Nations Fund's country representative. Mr. Adeyemi said this is one of his agency's major intervention points in disasters and humanitarian issues all over the world. We know that this is devastating and it has affected lives and livelihoods uh, of our people. It's unfortunate and that's why we are responding to that. We know that in that time, thousands and thousands of people have been affected. The continents that we're witnessing now, I just finished uh, a meeting with the, um, with the executive director where we try to understand what is happening. Uh, we follow the situation report every day, uh, every week, and know that it continues to affect people. Indeed, over 109,000 um, individuals have been affected, in over 6,000 households. Um, uh, but particularly, we also know that about almost 7,000 pregnant and lactating women have, have been affected by, by this uh, windstorm. They've lost their livelihood, they cannot get to health centers, roads are blocked, houses are broken. And uh, indeed, we are now even having internally displaced people, you know, who, who also consist of uh, women amongst them. Um, that is why, as always, UNFPA thought it important to respond and to support the government in its coordination activities. It could be recalled that the July 7th windstorm left many displaced, with 10 deaths recorded in the country. The government, through the National Disaster Management Agency, has been helping the victims cover from the shock and the UNFPA's support has complemented that said Mr. Sana Dahaba, the executive director at the National Disaster Management Agency. UNFPA is a critical partner of government. This is why they have gone all this way to provide the dignity kits that goes to support the women of this country. In any disaster or emergency situation, we all know the women and children are hardly affected. And any intervention that just to promote their dignity I think that's very, very important. Fatou Tao, the Director of Operations at the National Disaster Management Agency, thanked the UNFPA for the dignity kits. 
pointing out their relevance in the lives of the Winston disaster victims. They consist of um, feminine hygiene um, for women, items that are tailored for various cultures. Um, displacement can be very difficult. And when you are displaced, you lose many of your livelihood. You lose your dignity, you, you lose your pride. So we are definitely happy to receive this from the UNFPA. This is what they do every year. But today, I mean, we are very pleased that we are receiving and it will complement our programs and activities that we will be doing next week for cash transfers to the nation and everyone affected by this disaster. The United Nations Population Fund's gifts to victims of the windstorm were delivered to the National Disaster Management Agency for onward delivery to the targeted beneficiaries. Reporting for GRT's News, I am Fatu Janembai. Now, the journalism profession continues to face challenges in the wake of digital technology and citizen journalism. To this effect, the Premium Time Center for Investigative Journalism, through its Dubawa Fact Checking Project, recently trained over a dozen Gambian journalists on the basics and tools of fact checking. The training sought to instill the culture of truth and verification in journalism. Fatumata Cham has more in the support. The media remains one of the most important estates that uphold transparency and democracy in the modern world. The journalism profession, however, continues to be under threat thanks to the rise in digital technology and the ever-growing rate of citizens' journalism. With many with just a smartphone, with very little regulation or editorial standards, having access to wide audience on social media, information disorder, otherwise called fake news, has become the order of the day. To this effect, the Premium Time Center for Investigative Journalism, PTCIJ, through its Dubawa fact-checking project, is honing the capacity of journalists in West Africa, including the Gambia, to fight information disorder. The PTCIJ, founded in 2014, seeks to ensure an independent media landscape that advances fundamental human rights, good governance and accountability in West Africa. This is a very difficult time in the history, not only of the world, but in our own community, where we have uh, a crisis of information. And this crisis expresses itself mostly through a lot of misinformation and at other times also through disinformation. This has great implication for democracy, great implication for public health, electoral integrity, you know, and just how the integrity of public policy. Over a dozen Gambian journalists have joined the long list of their West African counterparts trained on the basics and tools of fact-checking by the Dubao project. Started by the PTCIJ in 2018, the Dubawa fact-checking project is the firmest independent transparent fact-checking platform operating in Nigeria, Ghana, Sierra Leone and Liberia. Dubawa aims to institute a culture of truth and verification in public discourse and journalism through strategic partnerships between the media, government and civil society organizations. We also are aware that Gambia is in its election year. Uh, at Dubawa, we've identified that during elections, there's a lot of misinformation in the period uh, around the, the electoral process, policy, and all that. So we chose Gambia because we want to help Gambia stem the spread of information disorder, what people popularly call fake news. Being electioneer in the Gambia, the training is quite apt. The expectation here is that these journalists will help in stemming misinformation from the public and reclaim the media's position as a trusted sector that follows strict codes of practice. We're dealing with um, information crisis and information disorder all over in the, uh, in the news websites and all that. So I think this is really crucial. Us having been trained on this will be out there to make some certain correction to certain information that are out there so that people would be rightly informed and then they can take you know correct decisions as far as their life and livelihoods are concerned. 
Governments consider information disorder as a social technical phenomenon requiring policy and to combat its spread. To this end, the Minister of Information and Communication Infrastructure, speaking at the end of the training, applauded the PTCIJ Dubawa fact-checking project for the initiative whilst assuring of his office's resolve to hold information disorder in the Gambia. Fact-checking, especially for the government, is extremely very critical because uh, it helps to decipher and to actually know the issues from all these uh, hyper information flooded that we have now in the country. You know, this platform can just do some good fact checking and then you know, come up with a clarification rather than always having to be there as a minister of information, try to fact check and then you know, respond to every little allegation that is out there. This can help a lot and it can bring in a lot of credibility for the media fraternity. And I want to assure you that the government of the Gambia, through the Ministry of Information and Communication Infrastructure, will work with you to see that uh, this component of journalism, which is fact-checking, is strengthened and enhanced. As the three-day training wraps up in Gambia, these journalists remain primed and poised to counter misinformation in a country that has seen an alarming rise in information disorder and where journalists strive to keep to the dictates and principles of their profession. For Jati's News File, I am Fatuma Tacham. Well, training on fact-checking there for Gambian journalists. Um, Momodo, I think um, this is a very, very important topic. Yeah, not, not, not only important, Winnie. I think it's really timely. We've yeah. seen the emergence of a lot of uh, online digital platforms and mm -hmm. video media outlets. Yeah. I mean, who care less or, or more about, about the kind of information that is spread out there for public consumption. Mm -hmm. uh, so th I think the training has come at the right time. It's uh, indeed timely. People need to be responsible and for the amount and kind of information mm -hmm. they send out there on the public domain. I think this kind of training needs to be coming as, as, as much as possible. Of course, yes. Okay. Now, moving on, members of the Canifing Municipal Council Staff Association on Saturday held their second annual congress to elect new executive members. The body is expected to steer the affairs of members for the next two years. The Congress was attended by delegates amid stalling revelations of financial misconduct by the previous executive. Well, Baba Silla was at the Council's chambers where the Congress was held and he filed in this report. It is the second annual Congress of the Association, another defining moment for members who assembled to vote for a new executive to promote their welfare. Attended by delegates, the deputy mayor, councillors, and top officials of the municipality, the Congress comes amid shocking revelation of financial money by the past executives. The deputy chief executive officer of the council and the deputy mayor of the KM assure strong support for the association and promise to recommend any outcome from the Congress. This Congress is organized in order to regulate and correct all the abnormalities that the welfare situation has been experienced. We believe at the end of this Congress, executive will be constituted, which of course without any doubt will spare the affairs of this important and noble association. So we are all trust and confidence. Those who of are going to robust, that we know election, and those who are opposed and they will go through election. At the end of it all, the committee, the executive that goes to the constitution, will of course, from the management point of view, will get the full value of the council. This council will support you to have a vibrant association that will represent the staff in the most accountable way. <coughs> to begin with, the office of the mayor, at the and Article 7 of the Staff Welfare Association wrote to the IEC to conduct this election to ensure transparency and openly of democratic fairness. I am aware that all ministers have sent in delegates in this event. We all need to play active roles, but in an orderly manner to make this process as a success. 
Deputy CEO Jane and KM Deputy Mayor both challenge delegates to exercise maturity to ensure the whole election process is conducted in a respectful and peaceful manner. 18 candidates have been nominated for various positions, including the position of Vice President, Sports Secretary, Assistant Social Welfare Secretary, and Public Relations Officer. However, the portfolio for the Presidency, Procurement Officer, Secretary General, Social Secretary, Treasurer, and Assistant Sports Secretary remain unopposed. Members also took turns to ask questions, make suggestions and recommendations as a way forward to ensure probity and accountability. With the coming of the new executive, members are more hopeful about the protection of their needs and welfare. For GRTS News, I am Baba Silla. The Basse Area Council has laid the foundation stone for the construction of three critical crossing points in the Upper River region. The project is exclusively funded by the council at the tune of $34 million. As the commander reports, the beneficiary communities are Kwaina, Sabi and Bajakunda. The laying of a foundation stone for the construction of the three bridges in the Upper River region. The Basse Area Council is another major infrastructural development for the region. The construction of the motorable bridges in the three constituencies of the Upper River region is expected to open up the areas for increased economic activities. Officials said an investment of more than $3 million has been estimated for the construction of each of the motorable bridges. Council engineer Yayasise said the entire project is funded by the council and it is expected to address the mobility challenges of the identified communities and boost trade links. The Chief Executive Officer of the Basse Area Council, Usman Toure, expressed joy for the development, saying it is in line with the Council development strategies. Uh, it's a dream come true in the sense that uh, since we took over the, the, the reins of this particular uh, Council, we have uh, promised ourselves and we have that we are going to make so that any little bit of tax that is collected will go back to the taxpayers and will make sure that the taxpayers enjoy the value of their tax in the sense that we want them to feel it, we want them to touch it, and we want them to see the value of their tax. Uh, access to communities, access for the movement of goods and services is also very possible and it is being uh, dedicated to the people who are paying this tax. Amadou Tamedou is the representative of Gambia Association of Local Government Authorities, Galga. This is a great initiative. If we create or facilitate road network for people, you enhance life and livelihood. You create access to education. You create access to healthcare. You create access to market for both sellers and buyers. And the list goes on. So this is a great initiative and we are happy to be associated with it. Baja Kunda native, who also spoke in the state of the Alcalo, expressed gratitude to council for the move, a point further corroborated by the deputy governor, Esa Contem, on the significance of the development. This is a history in URL. Even me, I was one time a councillor. This has never happened. In the history of the area council, implement four projects. That word, that four million, is a history. This is a good sign. And for the people of UAR, we should know that our taxes are not less. It is the first time the Basse area council is implementing such projects, one of that four million. In a year, to roll out in New Arab. They deserve to recommend this action. Chairman Fore Danjo gave a brief rundown of the project. This project will contribute a lot towards the social economy of the place around there, around here, and beyond it. It will boost their income and promote business and other activities, as it is an entry point to Senegal and many other places. The importance of the project also cannot be overemphasized. The land bridge of Convert, according to some elders, that the Samalolo Samit Bridge. The dam bridge got spoiled some 30 to 40 years ago, and today Pasi Area Council is coming up with one not only for our taxpayers, but the region and beyond who are frequent users of the bridge. Chairman Danjo seized the opportunity to reassert the gathering that the taxes they paid 
could be judiciously used. During the rains, it is always a nightmare for people to travel through the, through the stream, most especially when it rains. In fact, when clouds start forming and the current clouds start forming, the people will always will drive and park their vehicles across the area before the rain comes. It is it is a place where they have never benefited a, where they have never benefited a culvert or a bridge. And today we are witnessing a foundation stone lane wholly and solely sponsored by Pate Area Council. Official lane of the foundation stone was later proceeded by visit to the site in Bajakunda and Sabi Ward. Said the camera, reporting for Jazz's news file, Basse Okorivari. I say the camera there. Now, following yesterday's successful inauguration, the 55th Jalsa Salana continued on Saturday with multiple events marking the second day of the Ahmadiyya Muslim Community's annual convention in the UK. Day two saw scores of new converts paying fresh allegiance to the Khalifa and worldwide head of the Ahmadiyya Muslim Community. Baba Sila has the details. 25,221 new converts joined the Ahmadiyya Muslim community on day two of the annual UK Jalsa Salana, which takes place for first time during the global pandemic. The second day of the convention witnessed several presentations by dignitaries from all parts of the world. Their message is increased commitment to the community and its values of universal law for all and hatred for none. It's a great pleasure to contribute this message to Jalsa Salana 2021. The Ahmadi community has always been a beacon for tolerance, for people of many faiths and none coming together, living in harmony, peace and happiness. In his keynote speech at the Women's Lagna Convention, His Holiness Hadrat Miraj Mazur Ahmad deliver a lengthy address to the ladies of the community on a variety of critical contemporary topics including women's rights, marriage, social justice and freedom of speech. Islam teaches us that to pay attention to all other demands of society and if we do this then you can have a peaceful society. The second day of the convention is generally dedicated to women's issues which climax with multiple events led by women leaders from around the world. Obviously, even normal days when you don't see Azul in Mulakad when you, when you go visit him, it's so emotional to see him face to face. But after this great pandemic that's happened, no, who, who would know that we have been here today? No, no. Alhamdulillah, it was, was heart-touching. His Holiness Miraj Masur Ahmad relayed the miraculous development of the community over the course of the pandemic and what has been a year of emergencies. This is the day when we recount the blessings which have been bestowed upon this community throughout the year. By grace of Allah, in the entire world today, besides Pakistan, wherever we have established our community, the new positions are 403. And besides these new centers, there are over 800 positions and locations around the world where this community has put its foot. As far as establishing new places, Nigeria is on top of the list. Moving to promote global tolerance, peace and understanding, the Jalsa Salana is a massive beacon of unity which brings together people from different faiths and religions in the biggest Islamic gathering after the Hajj. For GRTS News, I am Baba Silla. The National Environment Agency, through support from the car powership, is engaging schools across the North Bank and the Lower River regions of the Gambia on a massive tree planting exercise. The activity is part of events marking World Environment Day 2021. The day is centered on the theme Ecosystem Restoration. Our correspondent in the region, Farmer Kanye, has more. Fifteen schools, including the Kerouan Basic Cycle, will be benefiting from a massive tree planting exercise. Different tree varieties, from essential to non-essential trees, are planted and named after influential people, including the regional governor and the education director. The exercise is led by students. Each of them here is expected to plant his or her own tree. The aim is to preserve each tree for posterity. 
reason behind uh, the tree planting is to protect our environment. Speaking to GRTS, Lamin Sedikan, the governor of the North Bank region, noted the environmental significance of trees, citing the slogan, no tree, no life. He called on the students and the school administration to take ownership. Recently, the destruction of uh, the storm, uh, one of the uh, contrib contributing factors is lack of trees. Um, nonetheless, uh, we have this in mind to do the planting. The initiative is welcomed by the Regional Education Directorate. In an interview, the Director of Education said, no human society can survive without trees. He promised to engage all the beneficiary schools to achieve the intended objectives. If you also look at the rainfall patterns, the rainfall patterns is uh, following where there are trees. So this alone is an example which can help us to understand that trees are very important. This time is particularly meant for school children. Sheikh al Sanyang of the National Environment Agency said the activity is part of events marking the celebration of the World Environment Day. Throughout the celebrations, the National Environment Agency will roll out a series of activities and community sensitizations on the importance of trees. The elders cannot do it. If they plant it, they will not protect it. So we want now the children to start planting it and see them grow together with their own trees. The activity is also first of its kind, and beneficiary schools are encouraged to put up strong measures to ensure the survival of the newly planted trees. This is one component of our anniversary. The other component is we target the local communities. In the evening, we'll be going to the radio stations where we'll be talking to people, telling them the importance of trees, the reasons why people must embark on tree growing exercise in our country. Farm. The KS Entertainment is partnering with the National Environment Agency and the Ministry of Environment. We go into camping, we go into communities with this uh, 10 beautiful girls or more than that but the last pageant we have it was 10 to sensitize people in the local languages that they can speak to tell them that our environment is our health if our environment is healthy is clean definitely we will be healthy to tell them that it's not up to the government it's not up to the NEA it's not up to the Ministry of Environment to make our environment clean for us but also we have a responsibility towards our environment being clean the tree planting exercise is expected to be replicated to 15 other schools across the North Bank and to the Lower River region of the country. For the news, I am Farmer Kanye. Well, you're watching us live from Banjul. This is GRTS News File coming to you from our studios on MDI Road. Well, we will take a quick break and return with international news. Don't go away. You How kept you me been? waiting. Sorry, I was stuck in traffic. You know how the traffic is. Hmm. How have you been? Looks like you're in a hurry though. I have this movie that I don't want to miss. Don't worry. With Afri TV, you can watch your movie anywhere and at any time. Really? Download the Afri TV app and watch your favorite TV channels anywhere, anytime. And I'll show you this application. There are so many channels. Okay. Just dial star 222 hash to subscribe and buy special data bundles at a cheaper price. AfriCell makes life easier. Welcome back and now to the international scene. We begin in Ethiopia, which warns that it could deploy more troops at conflict-held northern region after rebels from Tigray rejected calls to pull back from neighboring towns they have recently captured. A state media report quoted Amhara Region Security Office saying that an offensive would be launched on Saturday to deal with the threat posed by rebels. The move follows Tigray People's Liberation Front attacks on army camps. Jerome Shala spoke to CGTN from Addis Ababa on the latest. There are two sides uh, uh, of a story coming out of the Tigray Region state. One is about general insecurity uh, and the ongoing conflicts uh, between uh, the Tigray militia in the Amhara Regional Force, as you have also said, in different locations there, are, uh, there is a war going on at the moment. So insecurity generally, generally situation in the Tigray Regional said The other side to talk about is the humanitarian situation. Now uh, things look to be improving by the day, 
uh, after uh, hundreds of trucks crossed borders, are still crossing borders, filled with humanitarian assistance uh, uh, to be delivered for the Tigray regional state and the people affected by the war. So humanitarian situation, although it's still bad in that regional state, it is improving now that delivery is being made. So uh, the two situations, the humanitarian situation, improving and also war continuing are two uh, important things to talk about in the Tigray region of said Hana. Garim, what more can you tell us about the government's warning that it will mobilize and deploy its entire defensive cap capability to the Tigray region? So, the Ethiopian government, by the way, still maintains uh, what is known as a unilateral ceasefire as it has promised to do it, uh, one, because of humanitarian assistance to be delivered in that regional state, uh, two, because it wants to allow uh, farmers in that regional state, as it is a rainy season in the country, as you might understand, uh, to allow them uh, to plow their lands uh, so that in the future any kind of uh, food uh, shortage can be avoided. The third and most important one, the government said, it is also to... Uh, pave a way perhaps uh, to start any uh, peaceful negotiations. This is according to the government. But TPLF does not accept this and they have vowed to continue the war and are still continuing. Uh, as you've said, the government uh, government uh, sources are saying that it might uh, deploy uh, its uh, full uh, force against the uh, TPLF force, which are, by the way, holding important locations such as Lalibela, historical location. Uh, but uh, we should uh, know that the defense uh, force are not the ones uh, which are vying to do uh, an offensive against the Tigray uh, forces there. It is uh, the militia in the Amhara regional state and uh, the security head there who have been uh, heard saying that we're going to start an offensive. We have stopped defensive work. So today, Saturday, they're going to start an offensive, a large uh, offensive against the TPLF force, which are holding some parts of the Amhara regional state in the north. So uh, it is not the, the defense force, according to the people we have tried to speak to in the, in the ENDF as well. So uh, the government still maintains the unilateral uh, ceasefire. We don't know until when, but we know that it is the northern force, the Amara regional force, which, which is promising to uh, uh, start the offensive. There are two... Well, to South Africa now, where over 2 million people have so far tested positive for COVID-19, health authorities have now begun vaccinating one of the country's most vulnerable communities, the homeless. Pilot project to give them the Johnson & Johnson vaccine has begun in Cape Town, the epicenter of the disease in that country. More in the CGTN report estimated that around 200,000 people live on South Africa's streets, a vulnerable community that's been hit extra hard by the COVID-19 pandemic. The homeless people, it has been a very tough time, uh, especially in the winter. They're very um, susceptible to um, flus and colds and where they may have comorbidities already, um, TB, for example, or diabetes, um, many um, have HIV. You know, these are serious um, uh, health issues, um, which then they can be impacted further by something like um, COVID. 31-year-old Robert Magadui of Mozambique is one of the first 14,000 homeless people in the city of Cape Town to be vaccinated. I don't have a place to stay. I have to struggle to eat. So the pandemic has made it very difficult for me as far as being homeless is concerned. I'm living on the streets. I'm hungry and I needed assistance and here they gave me the vaccine. The Western Cape government says it will prioritize the use of the single dose Johnson & Johnson jab in its drive to vaccinate remote, rural and homeless communities. For homeless who are using for JNG because it's a one dose. Because with the Pfizer, it means that you have to come back again 42 days. So we have to provide j, &J and I'm glad that I now we'll be pushing more to be, uter to be used and also in other homeless uh, shelters. Because you don't want to bother people to come because they will, they will forget anyway about their return, I mean their return dates. Homeless people in South Africa who want to be vaccinated will be able to sign up whether or not they have formal identity documents and they'll be entered in South Africa's electronic vaccine data system. So today's been amazing just to see so many people coming um, and, and excited to be able to access the, the vaccine. I've been two years on the street and I'm very happy and relieved. The 
get my vaccine. A sentiment now shared by many homeless people across South Africa's mother city. Rene Dalcom, CGTN, Cape Town. And, and with that CGTN report, we come to the end of this edition of the News File. But before we go, a quick look at our top stories this hour. His Excellency President Adam Abaro received in audience over 600 imams and religious scholars at a state house in Banjul. Ensuring safe and standard housing in the Gambia, the Department of Physical Planning and Housing began a major demolition exercise in the capital city, Banjo. The United Nations Population Fund donates 1,000 dignity kids to the July 7th windstorm victims as they struggle to rebuild their lives. As the journalism profession continues to face challenges in the wake of digital technology, the Premium Times Center for Investigative Journalism has trained Gambian journalists on the basis of fact-checking. fact, fact -checking. And now on the international scene, Ethiopia's government wants increased troops deployment as Tigray rebels refuse to withdraw from recently captured areas. Well, new data suggests Johnson & Johnson vaccines work well against the Delta variant and recipients do not need a booster as vaccination ruled out for homeless people in Cape Town. Well, that does it for this edition of the News File. Join me at 10 p.m. again for another bulletin. Until then, stay safe and always follow COVID-19 precautions.